All right, so um, today we're going deep into the world of antibiotics, but not the usual suspects, you know, yeah. not the ones you hear about all the time. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the ones that target bacterial DNA replication and transcription. Yeah. Those are the processes that are really, really essential, you know, for bacteria to survive. Exactly. And for this deep dive, we're going to be focusing on Chapter 7 of Walsh and Venslich's book. Antibiotics, Challenges, Mechanisms, Opportunities. Great book. Yeah, an absolute gem. And I think as a medical microbiologist, you're going to find some really interesting insights here. Stuff you can actually apply in your work. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. We talk so much about the antibiotics that target protein synthesis, but the mm -hmm. ones that go after DNA and RNA processes, those are kind of the unsung heroes. Yeah, it's like we're so focused on shutting down the factories, but we forget about disrupting the blueprints. Exactly. The blueprints and the messengers carrying the instructions, right? right. The RNA. Exactly. And that's where these antibiotics come in. Yeah, and what's really surprising is that, you know, Despite the fact that DNA replication is so important for criteria, there are relatively few antibiotics that actually target it directly. That is surprising. Why do you think that is? Well, there are a few reasons, I think. One is that the enzymes involved in DNA replication, they're very similar between bacteria and humans. Oh, right. So it's hard to target the bacterial ones without messing up our own cells. Yeah, exactly. It's a real challenge to find that selectivity. That makes sense. And then there's also the issue of access. You know, the bacterial chromosome, it's all packed up tight inside the cell. Yeah. It's not easy for drugs to get in there and reach their targets. Okay, so it's a tough nut to crack. Yeah, it is. But some antibiotics have managed to find their way in, right? They have. And the most successful group by far are the fluoroquinolones. You know, they've been around for a long time and they've evolved through several generations. Oh, yeah. Fluoroquinolones, those are like the workhorses of the antibiotic world. I mean, from the early ones, nalodixic acid, all the way to the more modern ones like ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin. Huh. Yeah. We use them for all sorts of infections. Exactly. But remind me how they actually work. What's their secret weapon? Their target is bacterial type 2 to poisomerases. Specifically, there's two. DNA gyrase and to poisomerase the feet. Okay, hold on. To poisomerases. Now refresh my memory on what those do again. Okay, so picture this. You have two ropes that are all tangled up and super coiled. Yeah. And you're trying to separate them. It's a mess, right? It's definitely a mess. That's kind of what happens to DNA during replication. It gets all twisted up. Oh, right. It gets super coiled. Exactly. And these to poisomerases, they're like expert rope untiers. They come in and they relieve that stress. Gotcha. So the fluoroquinolones, they mess with this untangling process. They do. They actually bind to the to poisomerase DNA complex right at the point where the DNA is cut and they stabilize this complex, which is normally a very transient thing. Wait, so the enzyme actually cuts the DNA? That seems kind of risky. It is, but it's a very carefully controlled process. The enzyme makes a cut, passes a strand through, and then reseals it really quickly. Okay. But the fluoroquinolones come in and they prevent that resealing step. Ah, I see. So the DNA is left with these cuts in it. Yeah, and that leads to double strand breaks, which are lethal for bacteria. So these fluoroquinolones are pretty clever. They take this essential process and they turn it into a death trap. Precisely. And mm -hmm. what's amazing is we can actually see this happening, you know, thanks to X-ray crystallography. Wow, really? Yeah, we can literally see the fluoroquinolone molecule like wedged between the DNA base pairs and you can see it preventing the enzyme from doing its job. That's incredible. It's like a molecular crime scene. It really is. And these structures help us understand why these drugs are so effective. You know, their shape, their chemical properties, all of that allows them to fit perfectly in that spot between the DNA bases. It's amazing how such a small molecule can have such a big impact on such a complex process. It is. And, you know, fluoroquinolones aren't the only players in this game. They're also the JRB inhibitors. Oh, right. Those are the natural products like novobiosin and chlorobiosin. Exactly. They have a different approach. They go after the ATPase activity of gyrase. So instead of preventing that resealing, they cut off the enzyme's energy supply. Yeah, clever strategy, but unfortunately, they haven't had the same success as the fluoroquinolones. So they're like the bench warmers of the DNA replication targeting team. For now, yeah. But research is ongoing. You know, they still hold some potential for the future. Interesting. Okay, so we've talked about disrupting the DNA, the blueprints. But what about the messengers that carry those instructions? 
the RNA. Ah, yes. That brings us to RNA polymerase, the enzyme that makes RNA from DNA. Okay, now we're talking. This is where it gets really interesting. Right, and the stars of the show are the rifamycins. Rifamycins, oh yeah. R yeah. Fampin, rifapentine, rifabutin. You got it. These are big players, especially in TB treatment. Absolutely, yeah. They've been essential for decades. But how do they work? Do they also bind to the DNA? Not exactly. They bind directly to RNA polymerase, but instead of preventing DNA from unwinding or being cut, they block the exit channel for the newly synthesized RNA strand. Ah, so it's like setting up a roadblock on the RNA highway. Perfect analogy. And without that RNA, protein synthesis grinds to a halt. The bacteria can't grow. That's brilliant. So we have fluoroquinolones messing with DNA and rifamycins shutting down RNA. Yeah. It's amazing how we can target these fundamental processes. But rifamycins, those aren't the only ones going after RNA polymerase, right? You're right. There's a whole new generation of RNA polymerase inhibitors emerging, and each one has its own unique way of messing with transcription, like, um, you know, lipiarmycin? Lipiarmycin. Oh, yeah. That's phytaxomecin, right? Yep, that's the one. I feel like I've been seeing that prescribed more and more lately, especially for C. diff infections. It's a really valuable drug for those. What makes it so special, though? How is it different from the rifamycins? Well, it actually binds to a different spot on the RNA polymerase. It's called the switch region. The switch region. Okay. What's so important about that? So um, for RNA polymerase to do its job, you know, to make that RNA copy of the DNA sequence, it has to separate those two strands of DNA first, right? right? Oh, right. Of course. It has to unzip the double helix. Exactly. And this switch region is like a crucial part of that whole unzipping mechanism. So basically, lipiarmycin like jams the zipper. Exactly. It prevents that DNA from unwinding, so transcription just stops dead in its tracks. That's so cool. So we've got rifamycins blocking the exit channel and lipiarmycin jamming the zipper. Are there any other ways to mess with RNA polymerase? Oh, there are tons. There are miscopyrinins, corolloparinin, ripostatin. Like each one targets a different spot on the enzyme. It's really amazing. Wow, so many options. You know, that makes me think about what's that combination therapies. What if we hit RNA polymerase with like a rifamycin and a lipiarmycin at the same time? That's exactly what people are looking into right now. And mm -hmm. it's a really promising strategy. Because you'd be blocking the exit channel and preventing the DNA from unwinding. It's like a double whammy. Exactly. It makes it so much harder for bacteria to develop resistance because they have to overcome two different mechanisms at once. It's like having two separate teams dismantling a machine. Mm -hmm. Much more efficient than just one team working alone. Perfect analogy. And you know, this concept isn't just limited to RNA polymerase inhibitors either. Oh, you mean we combine drugs that target DNA replication with the ones that target transcription? Exactly. It's all about creating these multi-pronged attacks that bacteria just can't handle. I love it. It's like we're entering a whole new era of antibiotic discovery, where we're not just looking for new drugs, but also new ways to use the ones we already have. It's about working smarter, not harder, right? Absolutely. And understanding these mechanisms, these little details, like those binding sites on RNA polymerase, that's what gives us the power to design these therapies. It's like having a toolbox full of specialized tools. You wouldn't use a hammer for every job. You need the right tool for the right task. Exactly. And by understanding how each antibiotic works, you know, the molecular level, we can pick the best combinations to target specific bacteria and overcome those resistance mechanisms. Right. And this knowledge is especially important for medical microbiologists like you. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's crucial for anyone who's on the front lines dealing with these infections every day. We have to stay ahead of the curve, constantly learning and adapting our strategies because those bacteria, they're evolving all the time. All right. Well, before we get too carried away with all this exciting stuff, yeah. let's put your knowledge to the test. Oh, boy. Quiz time. Are you ready for some exam questions? Hit me with your best shot. Okay, question number one. What is the primary mechanism of action of fluoroquinolone antibiotics? Is it A, inhibition of bacterial cell wall synthesis? B, disruption of bacterial protein synthesis? C, stabilization of the DNA to poisomerase complex leading to double strand DNA breaks? Or D, interference with bacterial folate metabolism? Hmm. Okay, let me think back to those tangled ropes and the enzymes trying to untangle them. It has to be C, stabilization of the DNA to poisomerase complex. Those fluoroquinolones are so sneaky the way they prevent those enzymes from resealing the DNA. You nailed it. It's a really clever mechanism. You know, it exploits the very process that's supposed to keep DNA replication running smoothly. It really is. Nature is full of these ingenious solutions. Absolutely. All right. right yeah. Ready for question number two. Which bacterial enzyme is the primary target of rifampin? 
Is it A, DNA gyrase, B, RNA polymerase, C, ribosome, or D, transpeptidase? Oh, that one's easy. We were just talking about refamp and setting up that roadblock on the RNA highway. So it has to be B, RNA polymerase, no RNA polymerase, no messenger RNA, no protein synthesis, game over for the bacteria? Exactly. A refamp. And that's a classic example of an antibiotic that targets transcription, the process of making RNA from DNA. Okay, question number three. This was a bit trickier. Which of the following antibiotics binds to the switch region of RNA polymerase preventing promoter DNA melting? Is it A, moxifloxacin, B, refampin, C, lipiaromycin, also known as phydaxomycin, or D, novobiosin? Uh, the switch region. That's where lipiaromycin comes in, right? Yeah. The one that jams the zipper and prevents the DNA strands from separating. So the answer must be C, lipiaromycin, or phydaxomycin. You got it. You remember that lipiaromycin has that unique mechanism, you know, it targets a different site on the RNA polymerase mm -hmm. and disrupts a different step in the process. It's amazing how these tiny differences in binding sites can have such big effects. Absolutely. Oh. Okay. Question number four. Why is the development of new antibiotics turning DNA replication and transcription process is crucial? Is it A, there are very few existing antibiotics that effectively target these processes? B, resistance to existing antibiotics is a growing concern. C, these processes are essential for bacterial survival and replication. Or D, all of the above. Well, we've talked about all of those things, haven't we? The limited options, the rise of antibiotic resistance, how essential these processes are for bacteria to survive. It has to be D, all of the above. We need new weapons in this fight against these increasingly resistant bacteria. I couldn't agree more. This is a race against time, and we have to be exploring every possible avenue to stay ahead of the curve. All right, last question. What structural feature of fluoroquinolones allows them to intercalate between DNA-based pairs? Is it A, the presence of a fluorine atom, B, their bicyclic ring structure, C, their ability to chelate magnesium ions, or D, their long, flexible side chains? Hmm. Let me picture those X-ray crystallography images again. The fluoroquinolone molecule. It fits so perfectly between those DNA base pairs. It's like a key in a lock. And that perfect fit that's due to their B bicyclic ring structure. You are on fire. Five for five, you've clearly been studying hard. Well, I've had a great teacher. This has been a fascinating deep dive. It really has. And it's been a pleasure discussing this with you. Going back to that idea of combination therapies, it really does seem like that's the future of antibiotic development. Yeah. I, I agree. It's not just about finding those brand new drugs, right? It, it's also about you know, being smarter with the ones that we already have. Absolutely. And like understanding those little details, like we were talking about those binding sites, you know, that gives us the power to actually design those therapies. Yeah. It's like um, having the right tool for the job right. Yeah. You wouldn't use a hammer for everything. Right, exactly. You need a screwdriver sometimes. Exactly. True. And, you know, by understanding how each of these antibiotics works at, like, the molecular level, mm -hmm. we can start to figure out, okay, which ones are the best combinations to use yep. to target specific bacteria and overcome those resistance mechanisms. Right. And that's so important for medical microbiologists like you out there, you know. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's crucial for anyone who's dealing with these infections on the front lines every day. You got to stay ahead of the game. Yeah. You know, keep learn, keep adapting your strategies because those bacteria, they're always evolving. Well, I think this deep dive has given us a lot to think about. Definitely. From the DNA shredding fluoroquinolones <laughs> to those transcription halting rifamycins. Yeah, it's amazing. We've explored some really remarkable mechanisms. For sure. And I think we've only scratched the surface of what's possible, you know, with these combination therapies and with the search for new antibiotics. It's an exciting time to be in this field. Yeah. Even though there are challenges. It is exciting. There's so much we still don't know. And every new discovery opens up like a whole new world of possibilities. So to all of our listeners out there. Yeah. Whether you're in the lab or in the clinic. Keep asking those questions. Keep those scientific minds engaged and never stop questioning. Because those answers, those are the things that might lead to the next breakthrough in the fight against these infectious diseases. That's what it's all about. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of antibiotics that target DNA and RNA information transfer. Until next time.